Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's see if I can do this right today. Okay. Hey. All right. All right. So, but first of all, Chelsea, we're going to miss you for sure. I know we haven't been here that long, but you've already made an impact, and uh, you've already had a connection to our family before we even arrived here. And so I just love how the kingdom is. So I know he's going to do, God's going to do great things with you as he moves you on. Um, and we'll, we appreciate all you've done, the six years you have spent here as well. So, um, you know, today is Mother's Day. And uh, today's lesson won't necessarily be on Mother's Day, but I'm going to help hopefully connect it. Hope I didn't mess my notes up here already. <laughs> all right. If it's not the slide, it's my notes. Um, so happy Mother's Day. Nah. So, you know, here's, here's us, uh, if you pick up on this, we're, we're so grateful for all the hard work that women put in every day, specifically the mothers, all the hard work. We would not be here if it wasn't for your labor. All right, so Corny, did you not know? <laughs> wow. Uh, and that is the truth. And it, it goes beyond that, all the hard work. Matter of fact, I got a couple things I just kind of wanted to list when I think of moms. And uh, there's just, just a couple things, but uh, I could have put a lot more on here. But I think things that moms do, educator yeah. or teacher, a nurse or, you know, a boo-boo fixer, however you look at it, <laughs> a GPS coordinator, a chauffeur, a chef, cook, negotiator. If you have more than one kid, you know exactly what I mean. I'm not talking about the husband, by the way, or, your, you know, just the kids. Uh, law enforcer, occupational therapist, sanitation worker financial manager, market researcher, fashion designer, behavior disorder counselor, social and community organizer, just to, just to name a couple. Amen. And I, I could go on and on. And you know, I kind of looked through careers, and I was like, you know, the mom kind of fits all of those. There is so much. And as you know, I picked specific career topics or names, you know, that I've mentioned here because, you know, it is something that a mom does. Right. So we are grateful for all the work the mom have put in. And even if, you know, for me, my mom is no longer alive, but I have women in my life who has been mothers to me. And especially if you've been a disciple, you've been part of church for a long time, you have men and women who have actually made an impact on your life. And so, you know, I'm very appreciative of all the women who have made an impact on my life and the life of all the disciples part of the church. You know, this morning, you know, um, I'm kind of doing a little bit of a part two what I've been doing for the Yo Pros at Midweek. And so for the last couple of midweeks, I've been doing a, a dating series. Of course, if you ask them, they're like, we never really talked a whole lot about dating. It's been other things. But there is one scripture that I would consider that the Bible talks about dating specifically. Because you hear it all the time, you're like, no, there's nothing. The Bible doesn't say anything about dating. And that, I mean, in a, in a sense of our culture, the, the names and the titles that we use to describe certain things, we may not be able to pinpoint specific scriptures or words in the Bible, even like Trinity, for example, right? But uh, really what it comes down to is relationships. Yeah. And so the Bible is very clear on relationships. And dating is a part of a relationship that you know we have in our culture today. And there's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, it's, there's nothing wrong with it at all. It is very different what we do in the Western culture compared to what the rest of the world has done up to this point. And there are studies on that. And to be honest with you, the Western culture isn't as successful. We have a much higher divorce rate yeah. because of our culture, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I think it isn't so much because of what's done wrong. It's the idea of the biblical relationship that we have within, you know, with one another. And so the relationships are very important. So if you ever get a chance, you can look at Ephesians chapter 5, 1 through 7. We're not going to do this today. But Ephesians 5, 1 through 7 gives us some guidance on direction of relationships and at the end of that, verse 7, it says, don't even partner or date people that just got described in the previous verses. Mm -hmm. And so anyone who knows me knows I point out the idea, or at least the scriptures discuss the idea of things we should not do. Right. The Bible is very clear about a number of things we should not do in our lives, but it gives us tons of freedom of ways we can live as, as Christians. And um, so it's, I love that idea, even though it can feel like that God is just kind of correcting us, don't do this. But it is very few, very few things where the Bible may say something like, if you live like this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. All right. So we have tons of freedom. But in that freedom, there is guidance and direction of relationships. 
And I wanted to look, as keeping also with the theme of Hebrews, I wanted to look at a woman in the Hebrews 11. And uh, let's see if I can do this again. All right. You don't need to turn there. I'm just going to kind of quote a few scriptures. But if you wanted to take notes, you can write this down. But my first point today is on, is on Rahab. And its title, the point is, A Woman of Faith. A Woman of Faith. So we don't know a lot about Rahab. Matter of fact, uh, uh, there's a lot of things that even discussed and disputed by uh, scholars, which, by the way, I'm not one, um, that uh, have a different opinion of Rahab. And matter of fact, I will share an opinion today, and it is only an opinion, about Rahab. So with Rahab, you see a number of scriptures here. It starts off with the theme that we have, Hebrews chapter 11. It says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. Verse 31, By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Now, I don't know if you picked up on that. If you've been a part of the last few sermons, you might have picked up on something that was just said that was not said about anybody else. And that is, what is... Rahab known for? Being a prostitute. What was Sarah known for? What was Abraham known for? None of the others was pointed out. None of their sin was pointed out. But for some reason, Rahab, maybe one other person I think, where the sin is also equated there with their faith. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just share my opinion on something. This is strictly my opinion and it has no bearing on scripture or anything. But but I, I, can't, I can't look at this scripture after all that I've read and just go across it. I, I, I'm like, okay, God, why would you do this? Why, of all the people that you recognize by their faith and you did not point out their sin, but all of a sudden in this text you allow us to be reminded that Rahab was a prostitute. And so I said this out in multiple languages because one thing I've learned is when words are being translated into English, sometimes the English word will be added to describe the definition of another word. So sometimes the word actually is, isn't even in the Bible. And uh, I'm tempted to give you some examples, but I'm, I'm not going to have time for that. But um, And so I was like, okay, so this, this must be one of those times where the writer is just trying to help describe and give us some background on Rahab, but no, it's, it's in every translation. Yeah. It's in Greek, it's in Aramaic, I mean, it's, it's in all the translations. So, so it made me dig a little bit deeper into this word. And it was somewhat surprising, but before I do that, I, I want to share a couple of these scriptures, then I'll, then I'll dig a little bit deeper into this word. But it goes on, what we learn about her is Matthew 1, verse 5, is that she is the great-great-grandmother of David. Yeah. Wow. And so we see that she's in the lineage, right? When she's mentioned in Matthew chapter 5, the lineage of Jesus. So even that, if she is the prostitute that is pointed out in the scriptures, and I'm sorry to use that word, I know those kids in the room. But it is biblical, and it repeats that number of times over and over and over. Matter of fact, almost every time her name is mentioned, with the exception of twice, I think, they describe her by that title. Yeah. Right. And I, I, I kind of, I'll share again in, in just a minute. But So sh she's very important for the lineage of Jesus. We see in Joshua's chapter 2, Joshua, it says, The king of Jericho was told, Look, some Israelites have come tonight to spy out on the land. So the king of Jericho sent to the message of Rahab, bring out the men who, who, who came to you to enter into your house because they have come to spies out the land. So think about this for a minute. Two spies come in. Imagine going home and describing to your wives, yeah, we went to Jericho. Where did you stay when you were there? Oh, we stayed with a prostitute. That just would not go over well. But here we also see the king hears about these spies coming in and he's the only one who does not recognize Rahab as a prostitute. Matter of fact, he not only doesn't recognize her as a prostitute, he gives her respect to send people down to get her opinion about these spies that they may have stayed at her house. She misleads them, and the king takes her answer and does nothing with it. That tells us a lot about Rahab. Far more than the description of her being a prostitute. And so what I've learned is I dug into that word and studied that out, that it doesn't necessarily mean, always mean exactly what you might think it means. It actually can mean someone who is open to all. Somebody who is hospitable. Somebody, she could have been the, the caretaker of visitors. 
Now, we also know that, you know, there's a chance she would, could have been a prostitute in the temple. They also had false gods there. And so, you know, think about this for a minute. The king doesn't recognize her that, but he gives her the respect that he would never give somebody that would be called that. Matter of fact, to even go and knock on the door and say, hey, do you have some visitors here spying out the land? Would have never happened in that day. They would have done a no-knock warrant. They would have kicked that door in. They would have just, they would have tore everything up. They would have just went at it because of, she would not have respect that she would have as the regular woman in that place. Matter of fact, we find out that she actually had a window in the fortress of Jericho. Not you, you have to be very special to get such a high-rise window at that location. And so I can't help but think, again, I, this is just my opinion, and I'm, and I'm not saying that that description is not correct, but I don't think it's what we think it is in the sense of I think she had a prominent position. Now, unfortunately, there's ways to describe that too, even for her title is what she was or potentially was. But I think there is more there because we see also in verse 23 of chapter 6 of Joshua, it says, so the young men went and uh, they had went down to spying at the land and in it brought out Rahab, her father and her mother. Two others that you don't really find that goes along with that type of career back then. And so the king of Jericho, sorry, I jumped back up. So her brothers and her sisters and all who belonged to her, they brought out her and her entire family. And so here she is. Again, how we would describe her, the way we would think of her, everything we see outside of the text that describes her that way proves that she was not that. That she was more valuable, more important than what her title was in other places. And so I... I can't help to wonder, I'm like, okay, so why is this pointed out so much when it seems like she was a very respectable woman in this community? We also learn in James chapter 2, 25, it says, in the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute, again, in the New Testament specifically, pointing this out every time, considered righteous for what she had done when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You know, you notice there's a similarity, too, when you look at the story of Noah. Or if you look at the story of Lot, that there is destruction coming, and God relies on somebody to make the right decisions. And in this case, it's Rahab. And what I love about this, even though I just kind of shared a little bit of a theory and opinion, when I think that, that she's not the person we might think she is, and, and maybe we should be careful we don't judge a book by its cover, in thinking certain things, and again, I'm not saying she was, because we know all the other people talked about in the Bible were murderers, liars, thieves, adulterers, all those other things. So those sins were not any better than what we know that Rahab may have been a part of herself. And you kind of can't help to wonder what brought her to this position. Where's her husband at? She's also had a kid that's in the lineage of Jesus. Her husband isn't there, but the rest of her family is. But the thing I want to emphasize above all of that is Rahab was willing to risk her life for her family. She was willing to risk her life. She was doing what a mother, a woman would do. This is not uncommon. She put her life at risk to the point where the king came knocking on her door to question whether or not she was harboring spies at that time. And she took a chance, and she saved her family. Noah took a chance, saved his family. Lot took a chance. Well, he was dragged out, but he, you know, he had a chance. Uh, but we just seen that same thing happening over and over now. and I don't think it's any different for us today again we don't identify ourselves by sin we, we like to do that we like to identify ourselves by our failures or weakness but God doesn't do that I don't think God intended to point that out even about Rahab because all the other times it talks about Rahab it points out you know the courage that she had to make a decision that was right in the eyes of God and when she did that, she was willing to sacrifice, take a chance to sacrifice her own personal life so she could save her family. Point two. All right, that's my connection to Hebrews chapter 11. Point two, respect, our, respect the women. Respect our sisters. Respect the mothers. Right? I think, I think we're in a culture today where, and maybe this is very common, and actually you look back, and even when Rahab's time, women were not very well respected. And matter of fact, for, for centuries, you know, it seems like women were not treated very respectfully. And, and believe it or not, surprisingly, our culture isn't a whole lot different, but there is more respect and more opportunities for women today 
than it probably has ever been in history. And so, but that doesn't undermine just the fact that how difficult it is for women to have to go through what they have to go through, not including, if you want a family, all the sacrifice it takes to give all that up to have a child. And so we should honor the women. We should honor our parents. And so, you know, there's, there's a scripture that's going to help us break down a little bit of some of this with, the, uh, with women in our lives. And we learn from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that in an intimate relationship, you should always be devoted to God. Our devotion to God should be priority over any relationship. Matter of fact, that scripture in chapter 7 describes uh, a relationship as intimate as it can be. And it describes a relationship that even in that, you, you need to be devoted to God. Devoted to God in any and every relationship. So you need to go back to Ephesians chapter 5, if you're familiar with the beginning of that chapter. You might be more familiar with the end of it, where it talks about submitting one to another and wives and husbands. We love that for marriage retreats, but the first half of that really builds into that. Right. And it talks about, you know, following God, walking in the ways of God, loving as God loved, and how we should treat one another. And um, we need to be devoted to God first, which also helps us in our devotional love for one another. So in Timothy chapter 5, I'm going to read this verse, and you'll see a breakdown on the slides. And it gives us an insight on how we should treat people. It says, do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Now, we'll talk more about this on Father's Day, probably. I don't know. But it gives us some insight. You know, I, I will say, it just seems like in our culture today that older people don't seem to get the respect that they should. And maybe it's because we, we blew it. We've made a lot of mistakes in the past. And you're kind of reaping some of our mistakes, but you're also, you're also benefiting from some of the great things that some older people have done as well. And, you know, so, but there's a way to treat people. And as you, you, you break down this idea of devoting to God first, and, and then the golden rule of treating people the way you want to be treated, and then the practical part of learning how to love God and love each other, you know, there's a very simple practical ways of just respecting one another. And so you don't just rebuke an older person. I thought at least get one older person to say amen to that one, but okay. <laughs> um, and it says... Uh, uh, you exhort him, he says, but you treat and, and um, treat a younger person as a brother. Right, how many of you got siblings? How many have brothers? So as guys, you, you want to know why guys can be more rough than girls, right? Girls can have coffee, they have good conversations, they get deep, they get real, they get honest. But guys, we, we'd be very shallow, we'd rather arm wrestle or do something silly, you know, and it's just kind of this, that's just how guys, are. that's how we were with our brothers. Of course, my brother was much bigger than me, and he was older than me, and he beat the snot out of me a lot, but... But as I got a little bit older, I was able to take my own stand and, and uh, gave him a little bit of run for his money. Um, but I became a disciple. So then I was like, okay, I can't. I mean, I'm finally at the point where I probably could take him, but I'm called to love him. So, amen. Um, you know. Yeah, now he's broken both his arms, his legs, and his back. So I'm really sure I'd have a really good chance at this point. And then it goes on. It says, verse 2, it says, older women as mothers. Think about it. I don't, I don't know how your relationship was with your mom. I had a very broken relationship. But even though my relationship was, was broken, I would, I, it, and there's a number of things that, that I could easily hold against to how she raised me and the things that happened. But I tried my best to still honor her and treat her as my mother, even though I didn't have an opportunity to spend a lot of time with her. But the idea of how do we treat older women, we should treat older women as mothers. That's very different, and, and we should have an understanding, even if you don't have a, your mother in your life like I didn't so much, um, we have women that we look up to, as I talked about a little bit ago, and younger women as sisters. You know, uh, growing up, I have three sisters, and growing up, my one sister was two years older than me, and when I was younger, you know, she also beat the snot out of me, all the way up until I was able to, about seven or eight years old, I was able to take her at that point. My brother took me much longer in life, but... Uh, um, it was. It was kind of one of those kind of relationships, you know. It's, it's very different than my brother and I, how we fought. But, uh, you know, my sister, we just had a different kind of connection and relationship. So also not very much a part of my life either, but we've kind of stayed connected over the years. I also have two younger sisters, one I'm 15 years older than 18 years older, and so I'm much older than them. But there is something special. There is something different. Even though I'm not very close to them, when I do get a chance to see them, I do want to acknowledge that they're family. I love them. You know, they're my sister. And so you're like, okay. So that kind of helps us understand relationships a little bit, even in our fellowship. Or maybe a stranger. 
Like, I'm not sure how to respond to that homeless guy that I see, but he's older. So maybe I should, you know, instead of rebuke him, get a job, take care of yourself. Maybe I should treat him as if he's actually my dad. Yeah. That's a very different perspective. Or, or, or a woman, you know, maybe as a mother, I should treat her differently. Yeah. And um, it goes on, he says, again, again, younger women as sisters, with absolute purity. Amen. Amen. He's talking about mothers and Amen. sisters. Amen. You know, I, I, my wife and I have done a lot of uh, premarital counseling. We've helped do a lot of dating. And so this is, I told the, the Yo Pros Wednesday, so I'm not going to touch too much on this today, but I'm going to touch a little bit on, on, on Sunday. And so a question I get all the time, we did touch a little bit on this idea. In dating, especially in the kingdom, in the church, you know, you kind of feel like, well, the church has a certain standard. And, and that's okay. As long as we're not dogmatic about it and we're critical and judgmental, we are. We're allowed to have certain standards of expectations. Matter of fact, we're called to uh, teach each other how to conduct ourselves within the fellowship. That's what Paul yeah. teaches us. On, we, there's a way to conduct ourselves with one another. Amen. And we also learn how we should do that by, hey, older women are treated as mothers, younger women are treated as sisters. And so a lot of times when we're having these conversations about interests, it's like, so what are we allowed to do? Well, I know what you're not allowed to do because the Bible is very clear. I already, already established that. You don't do these specific things. That's wrong. But what about holding hands? Like, I'm like, so my question always is, do you have a sister? Yes. How do you treat your sister? Do you hold hands with your sister? Actually, no. That's, that's disgusting. That's why I would But there are many who do. There's, there's families who are very affectionate. Right. Matter of fact, i got family over in Europe, and it's not unusual for them to kiss on the cheek and hug and hold hands. And I'm like, wow, they're extremely affectionate. But there's absolute purity that goes along with that. And so there's a standard of how we treat one another. Even if it's in a dating relationship, it's like, okay, am I showing enough respect for this younger sister as I would my own sister? Yeah. With absolute purity. Amen. Absolute purity. Give proper recognition to widows. We're also given description of how we should treat widows. And matter of fact, we learn that uh, there's different kinds of widows. There's older widows and there's younger widows. It was very common for having a younger widow back in that time. And you actually treated them differently which we won't get into that day. You're more welcome to go back and read through some of that. Ephesians 5 gives us understanding of how we should treat our wives. As husbands, you know, I love that there's no conditions with these things, though. Right? It's not like, well, if my wife does this or my wife does that, I can treat her as if, as if Christ loved the church. I don't get that privilege. I did share Wednesday night, and I've had this conversation with a lot of men. Some reason, us men, we think that our wives should respect us. Biblically, yes, the Bible does call your wife to respect you. But the reality is, why do you feel like you deserve respect? Come on, bro. Who am I to demand respect for my wife when I'm called to love her as if Jesus loved the church? Amen. But when I start putting expectations, like you got to treat me a certain way, act a certain way, do these certain things, and do those kind of certain things, and I, then all of a sudden, I've got these expectations and standards of but this conditional love you go back to my very first lesson I did here in Savannah, we talked about that. Of the conditions of love, there is none with God. Amen. Come on, bro. But our worldly conditions, you know, that's, that's a worldly kind of love. We have this expectation. Should your wife respect you? Absolutely. The Bible calls her to respect you. Should women respect men? Absolutely. But that's not what we live by as individuals. We live by what we're called to as disciples. That's right. I'm called to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Amen. Amen. And if there's additional things we need to work out in the discipling time, we can do that. But the reality is, when we start demanding something, even though the Bible may say it, it's our pride that desires it. That's like when you're wanting to date somebody and you're like, hey, can we hold hands? Why would you want to hold hands? Well, I think she would be really encouraged if I held her hand. Would she really be encouraged or would you be encouraged? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I talked a little bit about that too in the sense of how, you know, for my... For our birthdays, I would do things for my wife that I liked. Uh, right? We had this connection. We do things for people like I, I really want to do this because I think they would. You know, really, it's you got to kind of look at that we do this for ourselves. Wow, benefiting us. The next one I have on the list is a prostitute, which we talked about the Rahab just briefly. Now, here's the thing: the Bible is very clear on how we treat women, not so clear on how we treat men. A little bit, as we see just two verses. But what we learn, if you go back to Corinthians, is we find that if you don't treat women like the first five I just described, if they don't fit in that category, the first five, we're treating them like a prostitute. That's earth-shattering when I studied that out and found out biblically 
how we should treat people. If we're being inappropriate, if we're doing things, we're not treating that person any different than we would a prostitute. And by the way, there's a good percentage of the word prostitute is used for men in the Bible as well. But we can treat, if we're being inappropriate, we're not being respectful, we're not honoring, we're not loving. And I, and I think this is important for us, as we're a fellowship of coming together. You know, it's important for us to recognize, because it, it can be somewhat awkward. How do I, how do I as a married person, you know, uh, approach a young sister in the church? Right? Or how does a single brother approach a married sister in the church? We actually did a little series on this years ago. And we broke down the awkwardness of completely. How do we, how do we approach? You know, of course, we're a very hugging fellowship, so there's the hugging part of it. We just hug everybody. Um, but you know, it, it, it is we're, we're very diverse in many ways. Not just racially, we're diverse by age, culture, and different backgrounds, right? And marriage, and single, and all these different things. And there's a way we should treat one another. And for women, we need to be respectful. To them and treat them as we would again if, if you're not sure treat women the way you would treat somebody you care deeply for Amen. that you would in a sense like Rahab you would lay down your life to save them because typically if it's not that we actually will lay down our lives to use them so we should be respectful and honoring people as well point three don't talk about my mama all right <laughs> don't, don't talk about my mom. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up, if you said something about somebody's mama, you could, yeah, look out. And yeah, I, actually, I, one time, I got slapped right across the face from a girl in school. And I didn't know what to do, because I'm like, well, I used to beat up my sister, but, you know, I'm like, I didn't, it, it, it can't, you know what I mean? It's like, and I was not raised, I mean, it was a very violent household. There was my dad abused my mom, and so there's a number of things that I've seen, but I, fortunately, I didn't pick up those habits. But I learned something very quickly. It's like, you don't, you got to be careful when you talk about somebody's mama. you got to be very careful. So you got to honor your mom. You've got to honor your mom. And how do we, we honor each other by honoring each other's families, right? And so Matthew 5, as I have this, or 15, I'm sorry. Verse 4 it says, For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother would be put to death. That's pretty strong, and that's a New Testament verse. You know, one thing I've learned is in every religion, in every religion, this is a command in every religion. As far as every religion I could find, they are commanded that you honor your mother and your father. So this is extremely important in every single religion. And so this idea of honor, I just kind of want to share a little bit about this because I think, I think we all have different experiences with, with the opposite sex, men, women. We have different experiences of our mothers and fathers. And some of you may have a great experience. I, I know a lot of people who grew, who grew up, who raised in a, in a great household. I was very envious to this day. They still have their grandparents to come visit them and they fly and they spend time together. And, and I'm just very envious. I'm like, I really wish my kids could know my, my parents and my grandparents. We're trying to change that with the, the next generation, but you know, I'm very envious of that. I think that's so important. But not all of us have that experience where you, you're so close to your family members that you spend time with them on Thanksgiving. Or maybe you do spend time with them on Thanksgiving and you're like, oh no, no Lord help us, not again this year. I don't know, but at least you get some time with them. And maybe hopefully this lesson will help you change the way you pers your perspective when you do get to spend time with people that you might have a hard time with. But in the grief that Tim will is to is to place a value and what that's what it means to, to honor someone and, and, and not a materialistic type of value but it's a place of value above yourself so honor is honor is is that i'm going to honor this person because i see value in that person so think of the word dishonor for a second that's the opposite of that yeah. the reason why we don't honor people is because we think we're better than them the reason why we could easily disrespect somebody is because they're not as good as me. And even in the contention we may have, even in our own families, my mom didn't raise me right, she didn't treat me right, she didn't do things right, and so I don't honor her because of that. So all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, I became better than her. And who am I to think I'm better than anybody? The Hebrew word, yakovad, uh, it's funny, you also pronounce it COVID, but kavad. Uh, <laughs> heavy, weighty, burdensome. 
And what's neat about this, the, the Egyptians use the same idea as when they would build buildings. And so what they would do is it would be a way to balance the weight. And so the honor, this honor system came to the idea when they would build something, they'd have to balance the weight. So to honor somebody is to acknowledge that their life is valuable, because if not to you, maybe it is to the God who created them. Rahab may have been a prostitute. She very well could have been. But God valued her above that and all the people there. And so to honor somebody is to see value in them and not see them for their failures, their mistakes, their sins. Right? That's why I had a hard time with prostitute being in Hebrews 11. They're like, okay, God, you just... You know, not that I'm anybody to, to crack God, but, like, but it was all going so good, and all of a sudden you had to throw this one <laughs> negative title in there. Um, so I still I still wrestle with that today, trying to figure out really what is God I want to know. I've just actually I've been wrestling with that text for a number of years, um, because those kind of things just I just feel like I have to really work through those things. So honor begins with humility. Even if you look at the person and they don't have the kind of job you have, they don't live the way you live. You know, they may act differently. Their sin may be something that you despise. You know, they may, whatever it is, you see value in human beings, regardless of their race, regardless of their education, regardless of what they've been through, regardless of what how they treated you, because God sees value in them. And so when you put that honor into practice, you now lift the burden. Now you help somebody. The Hebrew teacher I've been following for years, and he does a number of classes. He's actually, he still teaches Hebrew. He uh, specializes in Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, and uh, biblical uh, history. And I've been uh, taking some of his classes, reading all of his books for years. And and uh, he, he's, he's somewhat retired now. He's still teaching, but he's he drives a uh, handicap bus. And so through his whole life, he's tried to give back. He's tried to find ways he can give back. So he gives, he gives a number of hours each week driving a handicap bus. And he went on, he says, you know, he says, a lot of kids get on his bus. And I thought, well, that's kind of disrespectful. I need to finish the sentence, by the way. And so I'm like, what? You know, that just, is he going to point out how disrespectful this generation can be? Because that's what you all young people hear, right? Once you hear, all these people don't get it. They're, you know, they're entitled. They're, you know, all these kind of things. And he says, but you don't hear these kind of stories. But he sees them on his bus every day. He says, the reason why young people get on his bus is because they also allow the caretakers. And he told a number of stories of how an eight-year-old took care of their handicapped mom mm. and helped them get to the doctors. A 15-year-old who took care of a mother who had a stroke and needed to get groceries. Amen. He's like, they were weighing out. They were, but they were taking the burden off of them by honoring them, by let me, let me take on some of this for you. Let me take some of that responsibility. Let me honor you. Even though you haven't been there for me. What kind of kid at eight years old can say, my mom has done everything for me at that point? And there's a number of stories that, that he told, and I thought, wow, that was just so, so convicting. And it is sad, because I think that happens quite often. Those kind of stories we're not familiar with. And what I wanted to do this morning, I want to do something a little bit different. I wanted to have my wife come up and share how she personally had kind of worked through some things like this in her life uh, with her mom. Good morning. Um, I just asked Trish this morning if she was here. So she's, she's had that one prepared. Because um, I, I think I admire her because of, I know what she's been through. I, I know her family. We've been there through a lot. By the way, when she said her, I was there too, and her brother came, but she did all the work. So. And I didn't abandon her during that time. I was also. Um, Amen. And so there's no one that I know that I admire more than her Amen. as a disciple who says, you know what, I, I'm just going to love people the best she can, not because of who they were, because who God sees them. Yeah. And, it, and it does change things because I think um, we do have a hard time. We have a hard time holding on to the hurts that people have committed against us, the things that happened and different things. And sometimes it's a change of perspective. That doesn't mean the situation will get better. As I mentioned a week or so ago, my mother had passed. And I didn't get that opportunity. Yeah. I didn't get that opportunity. So I had to. I had to work that out with me and, and God. And God totally helped me work through those, those things. And, and so I think this idea, especially being Mother's Day, and whether it's the worst example we see in Hebrews chapter 11, not that Rahab is the worst example, but just the fact they put that in there is like, because um, actually there's far worse examples in that same chapter. You figure, how did Samson even make that list? I have yeah. no idea. But 
um, to work through that. Again, I, I admire my wife and all that she has done. So Rahab, you know, may have been not the best example, but she was willing to do anything for her family, anything so her family could be saved. She, she honored her family and eventually sacrificed and gave up her life just so they could be saved. And I think we get little glimpses of these stories into the heart of God. So God allows us to get these examples so we can see God a little bit more. And as I close and get ready to take communion, I want to turn our Bibles to, to Romans chapter 5. So this idea is we, we honor one another, particularly as we think about Mother's Day, we honor uh, mothers. Is and, and I don't know what it means for you because you may have had a situation like Trisha and where she was able to even reconcile, which took many, many years. Trisha and I have been together 34 years. And so I've seen that transition. And I remember those days. She was very, very kind and gentle about her story. And there's a reason for that because you're all watching this and we recorded. So, but um, thank you all for joining. And if you're sitting in traffic, we're sorry you're still there because I know it's uh, not <laughs> yeah. But um, so anyhow, Romans chapter 5 gives an example of what God has, does, has done for us and how much he loves us as we honor and as we honor each other, honor God's, or our mom specifically, it's acknowledging. And I, and I want to say, I want to say something I believe biblically is one of the greatest ways you can honor somebody, particularly your parents, is pray for them. Yeah. And here's why. You may be in a situation like I was where all I could do was pray. But here's the thing. Prayer, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're seeking God to intervene in a situation to relieve burden from somebody or suffering. That is the greatest way to honor somebody. And so even if you're not able to be present to help physically lift a burden or help somebody through a specific situation, you can have God who can intervene to do it. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in his sufferings. Which, by the way, is another word for honor. Glory. Uh, glory in his sufferings. Think about that. Glory in his sufferings. Because he knew that suffering produced perseverance. Suffering produced perseverance. Suffering reveals glory. Suffering brings honor. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when you were still powerless, regardless of how your family's been and people around you, God sees when you were at your worst, when you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely would anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person. If you had a good parent, maybe you might sacrifice, you might honor. And God says, you know, for an unrighteous person. So for a good person, you might possibly do it. You might possibly die for somebody. But God demonstrates his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. You know what goes a little bit deeper, especially as you use the word glory, that you can almost interchange with, with honor there in a couple spots, is God honors you. God honors loves you. You are God's glory. Go back and read John chapter 17. It's amazing. You are the glory of God. He spends every day trying to relieve your burden. He says, come to me all you, you know, weary and burden. He spends every day trying to relieve He tries to, to, to honor us Amen. in each and every way. And as we think about the relationships we have, whether close ones or distant, that we're called to honor each other and specifically to honor our parents. And Jesus gave us the greatest example as he lifted that burden as he died on the cross for us. Let's pray for the Lord.